Okay, we're back. We're live. We're doing. Gee, we're doing science today. Uh, we're doing science with a, a company called um, uh, Shark Band, B A N Z, um, out of California. And we connected with them, especially in view of the um, the shark attack took place a couple of days ago over the weekend. I guess. Um, and we have Davis Mercero. He's from Shark Band. Welcome, welcome to the show, Davis. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, it must have, it must have struck you in, in the business. You're in the shark business uh, as, as mm. somewhat remarkable about this attack uh, over the weekend with the tourists uh, here on the Big Island. Can you, uh, can you summarize what happened in that attack as far as you know? Sure. So uh, as you mentioned, yes, being in the shark business, I, I get the alerts in my inbox every day for when something takes place. And um, <clears throat> this was no exception. Um, the incident had taken place um, off of a small bay on the Big Island where a 65-year-old tourist from California had been actually um, kayaking, um, best of my knowledge. And uh, initial reports had said that a, a black tip reef shark had bitten her, her upper thigh, um, which means she must have been out of her kayak. Um, a lot of experts in the area are saying it's a tiger shark because of the size of the bite, which was 12 inches. And she was taken to uh hospital and she seems to be doing okay so that's always good news and um and i think you know full recovery so that's the best that i oh, that i good. know the situation yeah i yeah. but i heard more to that was uh that she was in in the kayak and she saw the shark uh, coming close or circling her and she panicked and when she panicked she mm -hmm. tipped over the uh tipped over the kayak and that that was the beginning of the problem um and, the other thing is, I, I don't know if this means anything, I don't know how big a tiger shark is, but the shark was something like five and a half feet long. Uh, is that the size of a tiger shark? Is that the size of a shark that would make a 12-inch gash like this? It doesn't seem that it, 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 it correlates to one another. So it, a juvenile tiger shark could be around that size, but to incur a 12 inch bite, it would have to be a, a larger shark. I mean, you're, you're talking of a, a, a jaw length that's, that's much larger than what a five to six foot shark would, okay. would have. And, uh, you know, I, I, um, my impression up to this point has been is that when the shark bites, um, this is a song out of the pre penny opera, when the shark bites. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> that one I don't know. Yeah, you're too young. When the, when the uh, shark bites, it it grabs and shakes, uh, or, mm. or is it different? I mean, how how does the shark create a gash, a wound like the one in the Big Island? Well, it's different for different species. Um, uh, related to this one too, I think it's important to note that um, there's never been an incident of a black tip reef shark bite. Um, off of the big island in this area. So again, we're really more likely dealing with a tiger shark and tiger sharks are, they're ambush predators. Um, and they also are uh, a species that will circle around their prey or oftentimes um, just to investigate a potential prey. So if there's a kayak on the surface, um, it could look uh, enticing to a large tar tiger shark or at least it would be curious and a lot of times what sharks will do is they'll simply go to investigate a situation and to your question this will actually make a, a difference on what type of bite will then oh, occur so if a shark is simply investigating which is usually what happens when you have a shark bite incident so oftentimes we read headlines and it says shark attack but really what's taken place is a shark bite a shark attack is very rare meaning that it's it's an unprovoked incident where a shark is actually hunting someone um it's in an ambush attack mode and that's rarely the case a shark um whether they're bull sharks or tiger sharks oftentimes uh, or certainly a black tip reef shark they're investigating and um they don't have hands so they're going to use their mouth and so that's why we uh, so often hear the term hit and run attack or hit and run bite. And so that's simply a shark coming in, taking a quick bite and then leaving. Uh -huh. So um, rarely what you, your question about sort of 
latching on and shaking. Um, that's something that we often see in videos um, or scientific experiment or, or bait videos where you oftentimes have um, like a tuna fish attached to a rope or something that a shark needs to try and break loose. Uh, so that's why they're going to, that's why they're going to shake too. So uh, when, when the shark bites, however he bites, uh, uh, what, what sort of, is it a, is it a gash? Is it a bite of their two smarts? Um, and how deep is it? I mean, you say the woman's going to make a full recovery, but uh, did this go to the bone? Did it break the bone? Uh, or is it just a good question? Like I mean, I, I don't know the particulars with her, uh, the, the exact particulars regarding her bite. But again, it, what's very interesting about sharks is that they each species um, does have different teeth um, structures. So some teeth are shaped more like a uh, sort of like a, a saw blade and they're they can have the, the reason why they would have that structure is so they can dig in more or they can break fish bones more easily depending on what their their um, their fish their favorite fish food is um, you have larger sharks like the great whites for instance which have more of a shark tooth that's you know the, the sort of classic jaw shark tooth, which is very sort of triangular in nature. Um, and then depending on the size of the species, um, that strength uh, of their jaw and the force impact is going to be different. Um, mm. In this incident, I'm assuming that um, she didn't break any bones, but oftentimes you do have that. Um, there's incidences here in California where you have great white bites. Um, on surviving victims where, sure, they go through the femur, you know, they can, I mean, they can sever an entire limb, obviously, which is, um, you had incidences of that in Hawaii with tiger sharks. So um, it, you can you can cut it a lot of different ways. Yeah, you cut, cut being the operative term, eh? Uh, do they, do they travel in packs uh, or, or uh, is, is, are some bites, some attacks, uh, just one shark alone? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, typically, uh, per particularly with a, a larger species um, that are apex species like tiger sharks uh, and great whites, they're not going to travel so much in packs. But if they're wherever there's a food source or a reliable food source, you'll certainly have more of a group of sharks there. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're hunting uh, together. Um, as we sometimes think of with dinosaurs sure. and other species sure. um, that are similar to sharks, right? <laughs> These age old species. Um, and then with smaller sharks, again, the same thing, uh, you'll oftentimes find areas where they're just simply a lot of them there, like reef sharks, for instance. Um, there are way more reef sharks um, in a particular concentrated area than there would be tiger sharks, for instance, mm, right? Mm. It's sort of the same, same thing as lions. Right. You're mm -hmm. not you're going to have a lot of antelope and you're going to have less uh, tigers or apex predators there. Do the do the groups um, uh, consist of only one species or can there be multiple species, big and little and different, you know, different kinds of sharks in the same group? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really the same principle as sort of the animal kingdom. Right. I mean, when you have uh, the ocean ecosystem right there there are always going to be groups of different species uh in in particular areas so you have uh, areas where there are various whale species it's the same thing with sharks right different fish um there there can be a collection of different fish species all in the same area mm -hmm. uh, and it's the same thing with sharks mm -hmm. you know we've we've heard of a uh, feeding frenzy and we we all uh, have heard and i suppose it must be true that blood in the water uh, will in, will uh, invite a shark, and a shark will, a shark will be following the blood and, and seeing that as a way to uh, find his, his victim, no? Right. Um, uh, very true. I mean, ultimately, sharks have really keen senses. Uh, I think that the one that we hear the most is obviously uh, blood and, and their sense of smell. So, um, and that isn't incredibly powerful um but it's important to note that sharks really do rely on all of their senses and different shark species have 
stronger senses uh, than others. For instance, the hammerhead, if you can imagine it with its the way that its its head is structured um, and its eyes are out towards the side, it doesn't have as good a vision uh, as other shark species that see directly forward. Um, but what the hammerhead does then make up for as a sense is that it uses its electro uh, reception um, in a in a more uh, in, in a more powerful way and, and at a greater frequency. Um, and same thing with vision, you know, sharks have excellent vision. Um, it's just something that we don't oftentimes <laughs> hear about or focus on right, as much because we're so worried. Way. Do we, yeah. do we have a cut? You know, when we go <laughs> in the water, we're so, we're so nervous and worried about, you know, is a shark going to approach me? Well, should we be nervous? I mean, it seems to me, Maybe it's a media question, but it seems to me there's a lot, a lot of shark bites these days. Maybe more shark bites than there used to be. Are there more sharks? Um, I, this is a multiple compound question, but is, is uh, global warming affecting the number of sharks? Uh, is sea change, sea, sea level rise affecting the number? I know that's a lot of questions, but, but I know, yeah, you, I know. Can, you can handle it, Davis. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, the 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 short answer is yes. There are more shark attacks uh, and bites than um, at other times and in history. There's two main reasons for that. One is that the first uh, we're we're simply recording them, uh, so we know that there is a steady a steady increase. Um, if you just think about the way that incidences are reported uh, and our communication with one another around the world, we have so much. Uh, greater ability to connect the dots and see what's happening. <laughs> um, as far as actually uh, bites taking place and why, there's really two main reasons behind that. One is climate change. Um, the water temperatures are changing. Um, it's affecting the food sources. Um, same thing with overfishing. Uh, it's affecting the food sources. So sharks are having to um, change their migration patterns and also, you know, their habitats and their food sources and the areas that, that they've uh, relied on for food. So oftentimes sharks are um, staying in areas for longer or coming closer into shore. Um, we have uh, an incident here in, in the U.S. that's taking place where Cape Cod is experiencing a greater number of great whites. Same thing in California, actually. Again, there's a difference in water temperatures down south and up north than there were 40 years ago. Um, and the other main factor is actually population sizes, both from sharks and from people. There's simply more people now than ever. So that means more people are going in the water. More people have access to the beach. So when you put more people in the water, there's more likely going to be an incident rate occurring. Um, and the second is shark populations. Um, I'll give you an example of great whites because that's what's happened here in California is conservation laws in the 70s um, helped protect great white populations, which were being hunted and killed or overfished. Same thing in the Northeast in Cape Cod. And those conservation laws then allowed those great white populations to repopulate. And so you have nurseries off the coast of California and down south that have then grown into adults and now they're in the area. Um, they're not targeting people and people are not on, uh, are not their food source, um, but it's going to increase the incidence rate. And that's what we've seen if you look at, at the international shark file or other records. It might dip slightly, so you can't have a, a steady increase every year where you can reliably say, well, there was 78 this year and next year it's definitely gonna be 85. You know, it might be 79 or it might be 75, but overall, it's a steady linear figure. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope I should answer that short it, enough. <laughs> no, 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 that's exactly what I wanted. Uh, so if, 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 is it fair to say that the sharks will follow the water temperature? In other words, um, are there more bites, more sharks uh, in warmer waters than in colder waters? Are there more bites, uh, you know, in tropical areas than there are in, uh, in north temperate areas or, or Arctic areas? Great question. I mean, again, it goes back to the previous answer, which is there are more sharks, particularly predatory shark species, um, meaning those that 
uh, oftentimes do, you know, are involved in, in the, the bite headlines, great whites, tiger sharks, bull sharks, they have uh, a tendency to habitate tropical waters. Um, and same thing for where do people want to go? Well, we're not spring breaking in, you know, Antarctica. You know, the, the sure, good people of sure, Hawaii are sure. staying on their island. Yeah, right. And everybody else from the mainland is trying to get there. So right. uh, it's a spring that's, break. That's what happens. On, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope not for y'all's sake, but you uh, certainly see it in Florida. You know, you also said that, uh, you know, these days we have the technology to, uh, to make surveys and, and make uh, world maps of where the shark bites are taking place and, for that matter, where the sharks are swimming. Um, who does that? What's it like? How accurate is it? And uh, what's the dynamic on the number, number and geographical location? Yeah. Um, you know, thankfully, there's a lot more organizations and well-funded organizations that are marine science groups than there were 40 years ago. Hopefully, we continue to have more. Um, and so they do an excellent job all around the world, whether it's in California or in Hawaii or in Massachusetts or Australia or South Africa, of tracking shark populations, um, getting a better sense of where, how those shark migration patterns are changing. Um, and we're constantly learning new things about sharks um, from that research. I mean, there was just a video this uh, last or two weeks ago where it was the first time researchers had discovered that great whites um, were willing to actually swim and travel through kelp forests in order to hunt seals. Previously, it had been thought that great whites weren't willing to navigate through kelp forests, like it was a safe zone. Um, and while that's only one example, um, and it doesn't necessarily debunk that myth, it certainly shows us that it's not an absolute, which is really what science is all about, you know. Um, and as far as um, as far as the bites go and tracking those, um, there's an excellent group out of um, Florida that's the International Shark File Attack File, International Shark Attack File, um, and they do a really good job of collecting those records and compiling all the data um, as much as they can gather about the details of shark bites and attacks around the world. Mm -hmm. you know, but there's still a lot that goes underreported. Too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll close the imagine. gap over time, you know, with better technology and, and so forth. Um, but I just, I just wonder, no, no. Are, are sharks, you know, some cultures, uh, they, uh, they revere <clears throat> sharks. They don't want to kill them. Uh, they don't want to hunt sure. them. Other, other cultures, they go out and hunt them and, and they eat them and take their teeth and sell necklaces, what have you. <laughs> Sure. But where, where is it all going? Are, where are the sharks migrating to in terms of being a species? Uh, what I mean is, are they, are they going extinct? Are they becoming stronger? Are they becoming more numerous? Uh, what do we know about that? Well, I mean, as far as uh, populations go, I think it depends a lot on the geographies and the species that, uh, that we're talking about. I mean, sharks as a whole. Um, their populations are threatened um, simply because of overfishing and practices like shark finning. Um, I mean, it's estimated that 100 million sharks are killed every year um, for the purposes of shark finning and, again, um, just not efficient fishing practices, um, which is really a staggering number when you think about it. And so over time, um, that will no doubt lead to population declines um in sharks as a sort yeah, of category yeah. as a whole yeah, yeah um but there is you know a lot more attention on topics like that and conservation and the importance of laws for instance uh just in this past year and two um there's a great organization called shark stewards um and they've done an incredible job of being able to really impact legislation um, on local, municipal, and, and nationwide levels. And, and um, there has been legislation changes here in the United States. Um, you know, it has to take place more on state levels um, and city levels first before nationwide. But to um, curb, pra excuse me, practices like 
shark finning uh, and ensuring and same thing too for private businesses. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's there's the airlines, for instance, um, whether they're commercial freight um, or boats that you know, they're not paying so much attention to what their cargo has been in the past as far as sharks are concerned. So are they transporting shark fins? And now mm -hmm. you've had companies step up and say, okay, we're going to pledge not to do that anymore. And, mm -hmm. you know, all those, those things make a difference. And that, that has a direct impact on, on population too. Well, that is a, there's a conflict of sorts because they're predators, it, they're, it, yeah. they're predators, they're killers. They, you know, they, they affect um, people swimming, uh, wound them or worse. Uh, they affect tourism because people go into the water in warm in tropical areas and and worry about it. Maybe they don't make the trip. Maybe they make the trip and get hurt. Um, and so you know, uh, so there's there's a certain push against sharks for sure. Um, but on the other hand, you know, from what you say, you're suggesting that aside from the cultural, the positive cultural aspect of trying to save them. And the, you know, the long-term aspects of avoiding their extinction. What about their role mm. in the ecology? In other words, if I took sharks out of the ecological equation, how would that affect them? Aren't they necessary to cull the herds of fish and other life, you know, in the ocean? Uh, don't we need to have them for that purpose? 100%. I mean, they are as vital um, to the health of the ocean and then thus, um, you know, the total ecology of the planet um, as a species, um, simply because they are so prevalent. So you remove them and you, you take away such a enormous um, factor from, you know, the, the sort of perfect formulas that, that, Earth, that Earth is in order to, to maintain its, its habitats. Um, and um, and its waters, um, and without them there, um, it disrupts the yeah. entire food chain, yeah. and that obviously disrupts our food chain. Yeah, um, it affects the health of the oceans, um, and so I think when you look at ecology, um, it's important for people to just think of it like, <laughs> uh, in some ways, maybe a puzzle where it's like. If you take away a piece, it simply won't be complete. Now, if you take away sharks, which represent many pieces, you're going to be missing a huge chunk. Mm -hmm. um, and so, how does it? How is it going to properly function without those pieces? It's 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 not going to be complete. Mm -hmm. um, and if you know, to use a, a more dynamic example, it's like a car, right? If you take away a part, well, the whole thing could could fall apart. Yeah. Right. Some some are, are more important than others. But, you know, ultimately, um, you know, it can be the smallest part that winds up, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> having your car. Having, part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> having, a, you know, exactly. So, uh, Davis, let's turn to let's turn to the company, to uh, Shark Man, uh, Shark Man's and um, talk a little about it and you and what you do, and, um, and then your advice to people on how to deal with this. Um, so the first sure. question is, how did, you, how did you, Davis, get involved in this? Is this a, a situation where you went to school for it, or did this some, other, some other process draw you into the subject? Yeah, I mean, I certainly didn't anticipate that I would be um, <laughs> in the role that I am or, or be spending as much time with sharks as I am. Um, my background and, and why I'm here is that I grew up with um, the two founders of Shark Bands. Um, we grew up in Charleston, South Carolina together, which is a coastal city. Um, and I've always grown up um, on the water in different areas, whether it was Charleston or, or California um, or Spain or Amsterdam. I've always been on the water. Um, so it's always been very much a part of me. And then um, the two founders who are father and son, Nathan and David Garrison, um, in 2014, um, they created Shark Bands, which is the world's first shark deterrent band. Um, and having known Nathan and David for many years, um, you know, I was excited about the technology. It was totally innovative. 
um, it was seeking to address a, a, a universal problem. You know, everybody is, uh, it's a, it's a primal fear we have. We're, we're scared of sharks. Um, and ultimately it would be an enabler. It would allow, you know, to your question earlier, it would allow more people to enjoy the water more frequently mm-hmm. and to hopefully have more respect for the ocean and, and want to spend more time with it. And then and as you- a byproduct, You've gotten to learn more about sharks, which is obviously huge because the, the more you know, the less you fear. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Important point. So can you talk about the technology? What is it? How does it work? Sure. So the science behind shark bands is based on the principle that, a, uh, that strong permanent magnets deter sharks. Uh, and the way that that works is that sharks have a very powerful sixth sense that we as humans obviously don't have. And that's the ability to detect electric fields. It's known as electroreception. And they have these very sensitive pores in their snout. And they, like I said, they detect electric fields and they use them when they're hunting and they use them to navigate the ocean um, in conjunction with the Earth's magnetic poles. So if you can imagine a, a, a fish tail moving, for instance, a shark would be able to detect that in the water. Um, and what shark bands does is that it, it creates an electromagnetic field using its magnetic technology. And when sharks come into contact with that field, it overwhelms this electric sense that they have. Imagine it being uh, someone shining a bright light in your eyes in a dark room. It's not going to hurt you but it's going to make you want to turn away. And that's mm-hmm. the deterrent effect. And that's what happens. They turn away. Correct. Yes. Wow. It's, it must have, it's, an, it's an active deterrent. This? You have a patent on this? We do. So we actually worked with the scientist who had originally made the discovery. Um, and there are scientific partners in it, and they're the ones with the patent. Uh, but we license it exclusively. And so... Uh, we've been able to apply it in different means and we'll continue to do so. So uh, for now, it's in a band form that can be worn on the wrist or ankle. Um, but in the future, um, we'll be integrating it more into native surf products um, and fishing. So more ways to keep people safe, uh, keep sharks safe, um, and, you know, keep the the puzzle together <laughs> so, so it's, a, it's electric and you have a battery and can you show it to us again no it's actually not electric so it relies on magnetic technology and so there's no batteries there's no charging uh it's always on so it's an active deterrent and so you simply wear it on your wrist or you can wear it on your ankle which i won't show you because i'm not that flexible <laughs> and um and it, that's what makes it such a simple solution. Um, and that was always the goal was how do we create something that is um, easy for people to understand, easy for them to wear, um, and something that would be comfortable and, and wouldn't disrupt whatever activity they were doing in the water. So, so is, this, is, this within the economic, is this within the economic reach of the average person or is it only for rich people? No, totally. I mean, it was always one of the, the, the principles of, of the product was to be affordable. So um, it's currently $84. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a very durable product. Um, the technology isn't going to diminish. It's not going to become less effective over your lifetime. Um, and it's very similar to like a surf watch or, um, or a, like a, a high-end Fitbit in terms of the silicone rubber. So it's very comfortable. Um, mm-hmm. It's very durable. You know, we designed it to be able to hold up in the, you know, the most intensive surf conditions um, or ocean sport activities. Are, so, are there a set of circumstances which could actually prevent it from working? Sure. I mean, it's it's a safety device, right? I mean, that's what we always uh, make sure that that people are aware of is that it's the same thing as a bike light, for instance, or um, a bike helmet. Um, There's lots of different examples of safety devices I can use, but I'll just use bike lights, for instance, right? So you have a bike light 
on your bike in order to reduce the risk, right? Uh, you don't want to get hit by a car. Um, and then you want to let other bikers know that you're there. So that's essentially what Shark Bands is doing. It's letting sharks know that you're there, but to stay away. Mm. Um, it doesn't mean that you should go out into shark infested waters and that you're going to be 100% safe, right? I wouldn't take my bike with its bike lights and, and jump on the highway. Right. Uh, it might help my cause, but <laughs> it's, it's not smart. <laughs> well, you know, I'm wondering if there's a competition or are you the only, uh, the only game in the, in the field here? Uh, I, you know, I recall years ago, uh, guys who uh, went um, you know, scuba diving around Hawaii would carry these uh, bang sticks. Now that that's mm. that's not so good for the shark. Mm. <laughs> that would be that mm. would it would have a shotgun shell in it, and when it made contact with the shark, <laughs> it would blow half the shark away. Um, that was an alternative, yeah. though, to protect you. Is there anything else uh, right. that that is a uh, competitive with your shark bands product? So there. There's another um, device on the market um, that does actually use battery. Um, so it is generating a live electric current in the water. The problem with that is, is that it's very cumbersome. They're expensive. Um, and ultimately, it's, uh, it, it's just, it's not a common sense solution for everybody. Is it effective? Yes. It will keep sharks away from that electric source, but it's not practical, mm. unfortunately. Um, so if I want to get a Shark Bands product, um, a wristband or, you know, some of the other things you're going to put on the market, uh, where do I get them? Uh, are they available through, uh, you know, online stores? Or do I have to go to a, um, you know, a dive shop or what? Yeah, for sure. A lot of different ways. So we sell them on sharkbands.com, just our website. Um, and then we work with a lot of specialty retail stores. Um, we work with some in Hawaii. We work with three on the big island itself where the latest incident took place. Um, Bike Kona and um, Orchid Land and Polynesian Paddling. Mm -hmm. um, and within Hawaii, we also work with High Tech um, Maui, High Tech Sports, um, as well as Adventure Sports, um, as well as a number of different independent retailers that we love working with. Um, and same thing too, you can jump on our website and we have a store locator. So if you wanna support your local shop, that's awesome. Um, you can get on and see if they, they carry them. Um, just enter your zip code. Um, if they don't carry them, you could tell them to carry them. We always like working with new people who care about you know their products and their customers. Um, and we yeah, we work with, um, we sell them around the world now. We work with distributors in Australia and South Africa and Japan. Um, we sell them in Europe. So they've uh, they've really taken hold and um, and they've created a really good following and, and support base. You know, particularly in Hawaii, where people spend so much time in the water. I mean, we have um, a lot of really dedicated core um, Hawaii oceanmen, whether they're spear fishermen um, or surfers who are wearing them. Um, and triathletes, uh, and same thing in California and Florida, um, and in Australia as well, lifeguards, um, like Harry's Carroll, who's on Bondi Rescue. Mm -hmm. and, um, so it's, we, we've really started to build a good base and, and an understanding around the technology and an adoption for it. Um, but like I said, it is a safety device. So, you know, we're, we're chipping along here. I, not everybody wanted to wear a seatbelt when the when the car well, first came out. It sounds like but... you have everything to gain by having one with you and nothing to lose. Um, so, um, you know, the choice of going in the water with that or going in the water without that it seems to be clear. Uh, let me ask you one last question before we run out of time, Davis. And that is, uh, sure. you know, I had the impression that you guys also you know, advise people about how to conduct themselves around sharks, uh, banned or mm -hmm. no banned. Um, and, uh, you know, dealing with, um, you know, the possibility of, um, you know, having them go away from you, either striking them or ignoring them or turning your back. I don't know what the right approach is, but can you talk about, you know, general behavior, conduct to help you save yourself in the face of a shark? Sure. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I would say that there's probably two main um, 
ways outside of, let's say, shark bands to stay safe if you are around sharks. The first would be don't splash and create a bunch of attention around yourself at the surface. Um, it's only going to bring attention to yourself um, or make you actually look like wounded prey. I mean, if you think about sharks, they are this evolutionary machine, right? So they are always going to find the path of least resistance. And oftentimes they'll hunt for weaker seals or, or uh, fish, right? So they're looking for a disruption. They're looking something that's sort of thrashing or splashing around in the water. It signals weakness. Um, so don't splash around in the water. If there's a bunch of sharks, you know, don't maintain your, your composure as best possible and try and stay calm. Um, be aware of your surroundings uh, as best you can. Uh, and the other is that if you were actually engaged in a shark attack um, with a shark species, um, the best advice would simply be to try and jab at its eyes um, because that's really the only vulnerable spot um, that you're going to be able to make an impact on. You don't want to stick your hand towards its mouth, obviously. So the only way you're going to to create an impact on a shark that's attacking you is, you know, is its eyes. With, with your hand, with your fingers. With your hand. And yes. what about the old, the old... Uh, I pray that doesn't or... happen to individuals or listeners of your show, but <laughs> if they do remember that... If they do remember that advice, God bless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, because at the moment it's hard to remember anything. Um, what about the old, old wife's tale of hitting its snout, the, the shark on the snout? That would be above his mouth. It, sure. I mean, it's the same, it's the same idea. It's, it's simply something to alert the shark that you're not food or that you're willing to fight back. The risk of that is simply, you know, you can imagine a situation like that taking place. If you're trying to hit it on its snout, it can work, but um, you're just getting your hands closer to its mouth. Yeah, so, right. so if he turns up at you, your hand is right there in right. his mouth. Yeah. Exactly. So that's why I would uh, say another, uh, you know, that's why experts say go for yeah. eyes and, and hearing stories of sharks or excuse me, shark, shark survivors who have had really, you know, intense encounters with sharks, um, you know, basically being, being in the, you know, its jaws is they've been able to escape those circumstances um, by hitting its eyes. Very interesting and actually a little scary. <laughs> yeah, Marshall definitely a little scary, you know. <laughs> have shark well, bands. Don't focus on that part of the, exp <laughs> really? the experience well, or being in the water. This, this, uh, Worst this, case scenario. There's a uh, woman who, who surfs uh, from, I think she's from mm -hmm. Kauai. She lost an arm a few years ago, sure. maybe 10 yeah. years ago. And she still surfs. Yeah, yeah right, right. Yeah, Steph. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, it's possible. A very inspiring individual. Yeah. 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 It, 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 exactly. There, there is life after. <laughs> there is life after a shark bite. Thank you, Davis yes. Mercer <laughs> of Shark Bends. It's great my to pleasure. talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on our Thank show. Thank you so much. Aloha. Yeah, my pleasure. You guys stay safe out there. <laughs>